So this guy's done it. Carlos Alcaraz wins Roland Garros for the first time, defeating Sasha Zverev in five sets. In five sets. Again. This kid can't be stopped. Takes out Sinner in the semifinals, Zverev in the finals, and I don't even think he reached his top level the entire time. And he still won his first Roland Garros, third major. We're going to talk about it all. Is he the most impressive 21-year-old tennis player of all time? How big is his ceiling? Like, what's going on? So we're going to talk about how this match went, how his Carlos's tournament went, how he was able to win Roland Garros after potentially entering the tournament with an injury. We're going to break it all down. Here's the slice. All right. I mean, you just run out of words to say about Carlitos Alcaraz. Like, what can we say to describe this kid that hasn't already been said? He's a freak. He's a gift from heaven. He's unbelievable. He won wins today battling through some potential cramps in the match, some discomfort in his body, down two sets to one, comes back just like he did against center and wins in five. It's just unbelievable. Absolutely unbelievable. Okay, before I go more into depth about how unbelievable Carlos Alcaraz is, if you're new here, thanks for being here. Welcome to The Slice. Smash the subscribe button. Help us get to 20,000 subscribers and you'll become a better tennis player once you subscribe. It's like a weird phenomenon. Who's also a phenomenon is Carlos Alcaraz, as I was just saying. Unbelievable tournament for him. He wins Roland Garros. He's the first or the youngest player to ever win three majors or a major on three different surfaces. He's the youngest player to ever do it. Uh, and to me, that poses a question. Is he the greatest or best 21-year-old tennis player of all time, at least in the men's game? Uh, and you kind of got to think, yeah, like to me, he's the most impressive at this age. Dow was right there. Obviously he'd won, I believe maybe more majors at this point, but he was a little bit more one dimensional. You would say on clay, uh, Alcaraz has already won Wimbledon beating Djokovic in the final. He's won the US open. Now he's won Roland Garros beating like a super tough, uh, route to the final, which we'll talk about. Um, so, you know, there's, like I said, there's just not enough words to, to, to describe him so so yeah i'm gonna in this video i'm gonna talk a little bit about the history books where he's sitting and then i'm gonna talk about uh his this match him versus out zverev there was some controversy in the match zverev looked like he was in the driver's seat for some of it, it looked like he might have got destroyed in the first couple of sets this match really ebbed and flow it wasn't the highest quality match as everyone was saying uh, neither guy was like both peaking at the same level um but it was a little nervy Grand Slam final because between guys who are not, you know, they've, you know, Alcaraz has been there before and won. Zverev hasn't, but they're not. We're not used to seeing like Djokovic and Federer or Nadal come out and just play great tennis because they've been there dozens of times to the major finals. Um, one more no, I was thinking about this. I was thinking where where could Alcaraz go in his career with this? Like you know, everyone's, you know, we've just seen Djokovic get to twenty four majors, Nadal twenty two, Federer twenty. You're like, do any of these guys have a chance of touching them? And to put Djokovic's dominance in perspective as far as majors go, Alcaraz is at three right now. He's 21. He could win 50% of the majors for the next 10 years and still not be at as many majors as Djokovic. I think that's right. Math people, you know, fact check me. But he could win two majors a year, Carlos Good, for the next 10 years till he's 31 and still not be at 24. He'd be at 23, I guess. Theoretically, he's still got the rest of this year, obviously, two more majors. Um, but that's just to put into dom to, to perspective how crazy these guys have been. But Alcaraz has now been able to burst through at the tail end of their career, really Djokovic's career, uh, and you know, assert himself now as another total freak show, amazing generational talent on the on the world stage here. So he wins this match. Like I said, it was it was a pretty gritty match. You know, I was, uh, I was unfortunately traveling today. So I was listening to it and watching to it, the, watching it the entire time, but I was able to get really, you know, in depth kind of feel of the ebbs and flows of the match. So Carlos comes out first set playing better than Zverev. Zverev's tight. Uh, it takes the first set. And then, um, Zverev comes back, plays a great second set, 
gets over Alcaraz. Maybe Alcaraz deflates a bit, starts to make more errors. And then the third set, Alcaraz is up 5-2. Looks like he's going to start taking over the match again. And then all of a sudden, he kind of deflates again. He gets maybe a bit tight. Zverev storms back and ends up taking that set. Wins five games on the trot. You're like, what? And then now we kind of know. Zverev goes up two sets to one, just like Sinner did. And then Alcaraz goes, ah, I've got you just where I want you. And he comes back. And really, for the last two sets, was a much more confident, much more complete player. Uh, so, yeah, that was just a super interesting match. Let's throw the stats up here. Let's get into that before we go into some of the interesting things I saw about the way Alcaraz played and the yeah the style of of the match in general. So five sets, six one, six two. The last two sets on paper it looks really easy. Obviously it was tight and it wasn't that easy. Interesting stats here: Zverev eight aces, not as many you know as you would think over five sets. Um, so maybe he didn't have his best serving day, but Alcaraz also gets a racket on a ton because he's a freaking cat. Uh, first serve percentage, 73% first serves in. So maybe Zverev just wanted to keep that percentage high and wasn't going for as many lines. Crazy stat here, win percentage on first serve. Alcaraz wins a higher percentage of his first serve and second serve points. So that's crazy. Like Al Zverev has a much better serve than Alcaraz, and you cannot lose that battle like you've got to win a higher percentage of your serve so maybe Zver would have a better chance than this on at at uh, on grass or on a quicker hardcore um and if he was serving more bombs and being more aggressive, being more aggressive he's not able to be his fully aggressive redlining self in these major finals we've seen that and these big big moment matches in majors he's just not that guy at this point i think that's fair to say um rally analysis this is going to be interesting so yeah so obviously Alcaraz wins a lot more points um wins in the one to four shot category every category um but as you can see there's like most of the points are in that one to four shot category um and again Zverev with the, the serve that he has I think he should have more domination in that realm but he didn't and Alcaraz did and that's that's pretty crazy so let's go into a bit more detail in these stats here. Uh, break points, break points converted nine out of sixteen for Alcaraz, only six out of twenty-three for Zverev. So that's not a great conversion rate there. Uh, winners, fifty-two winners for Alcaraz, uh, fifty-six unforced errors. So again, not his top level, not his craziest, cleanest match, uh, but just a lot of pizzazz. Uh, basically, the same ratio for for Zverev, just less winners, less unforced errors. Uh, net points, 63% for Alcaraz, 57% for Zverev, both at the net a lot. Um, yeah, so interesting. Interesting match. One of the things that was interesting in the play style that I saw Alcaraz do was, you know, the variety from his back end, from his game. He's, you know, Zverev does have the bigger strokes and his back end is super dangerous. So you would see when they got into back end to back end rallies, you'd see Alcaraz lob a lot of balls like do these high spinning shots that kick the ball way up and they're slower to the Zvera backhand or forehand and make, he was making Zvera generate the pace Zvera doesn't want to do that he likes when the pace comes to him and he can increase it going back and hit through you basically impossible to hit through Alcaraz with no pace going the other way uh and then he's hitting around the outside of the ball on his forehand just boom ripping it off the side of the court through that sideline tons and tons of time um like he would Lob a backhand, and then Zverev would go up the line, and he'd be like, "That's where I want you." And then he rip, and then Alcaraz would rip it cross court, going around the outside of the ball, and really making Zverev move. And then he would come forward, cut it off, drop shot, do, do what Alcaraz do does. And his instincts and his court vision and his the way he knows how to use the entire court and play with his body, and it's just still just so crazy to me that at twenty to tw at twenty one years old, he has all these instincts. We saw that Wimbledon last year, just the way he can play has the feel the drop shots we've touched talked about it but it's just like it's just so crazy that he has all that going for him at this age so Alcaraz was playing great in a lot of parts of these matches in a lot of parts of this match um but he also had some down moments where Zverev just wasn't able to capitalize um he capitalized in the third set when he came back from from uh five two down to win it but then, you know, Alcaraz, again, is able to flip the switch and just get a few rallies in, 
or get a few good rallies back to back, hit some winners, and then pump up the crown and like get himself back into it. He is, you know, for again for twenty one year old, super short memory as far as bad, um, bad moments. And and you know, I've seen in shorter matches and in, in best of three matches where he's, you know, if that was a best of three match, he would have lost that third set, seven five, and that's where you've seen him falter. But in five sets, he's able to figure it out, change his mindset, figure it out. And find his, you know, what he needs to find to get over the line and to win. So he's like unbelievably clutch. Um, and there was definitely some chokiness from Zverev here at certain parts. Um, and he didn't play good. I think he, you know, in the, I think it was the beginning of the fourth set. I forget when I tweeted that out. Um, that he donate, he absolutely donated a break to. Um, that was the fifth set crucial fifth set Zverev just donates a break in the third game to Alcaraz with an unforced error on a volley terrible volley unforced error on another, another volley unforced error on a backhand long and then he got a point and then another unforced error on the backhand long so that was crazy now that brings me to my next point in the tournament in general so right after Zverev broke there in the third game he should have broken back so the there was a serve that uh, Alcaraz basically double faulted on on break point that was called out, and then the umpire overruled and called it in. Zverev loses running, runs up there, and he's like, "This is out," and the umpire says it's in. And then on the replay, Hawkeye it shows it like a millimeter out. Now everyone's talking about the there's there's a margin of error on Hawkeye that's like 2.2 millimeters, I think. So this you know it was like showing like a millimeter, I believe, out on the Hawkeye. So that could be wrong. That could be on. In reality, that's probably just not. That's probably not in, or it's in. I don't know. I don't know how to. I don't know how to to um, to to play that one because the the lines person called it out, and then the umpire overruled. So that's all. Like, to, in my point, you just got to use one system or the other because showing that is very frustrating because it shows it out, but it might not even be accurate. So if it's just like the umpires on the court just calling it, then. You don't know if Zverev got screwed or not. You just know it's a close call. So, to me, that makes it more painful for if Zverev goes back and can like see it on TV or on the replay. But you know, if you're just playing it live, you got to play it live. I think they just got to pick one or the other. They got to use Hawkeye or not use Hawkeye at all because that was painful. The center one back from Monte Carlo when center, um, it was it was an even way worse call. The ball was like this far out and it got called, uh, got overruled and called in or whatever. That was more like you know. Center knew it was out. He could see the mark, and it, it, you know he kept playing. He didn't stop the, the point there, um, or I mean, I guess it didn't call, get called out. So, anyways, that was painful. That's a bit of a in general the tournament part of the things. I think they got to figure out. They got to either do the Hawkeye or not do the Hawkeye. Um, but that's just a point uh, in general about the tournament. So, what else happened in the tournament? Obviously, Iga Sviantek won yesterday. I wasn't able to make a video about it, but she deserves a video. She's unbelievable. Outside of the Osaka match where she almost lost, she basically steamrolled everyone, uh, plays Paolini in the final, and it's just much too good for her. I don't even have her major count now at the top of my head. I think it's five, uh, but she's you know, she's and she's young. She's 23 years old, I believe. And it's just that's also just incredible where she's at. And to think that she could play for another seven, ten years uh is crazy. Um so yeah, she's on clay, absolutely the queen of the WTA. Um and the WTA is super interesting going into Wimbledon because she's not the queen there. Uh, a lot of girls could win that or women could win that tournament. Uh, so we'll have to see. The ATP is kind of in a similar place now. Like I've talked about how the big four, Djokovic, Sinner, Alcaraz, and Medvedev for a while on the hard courts were the guys. You know, you think you got to put Zverev in there now. Um, he's playing great again. He's right there. I think he probably will get a major in the next year or two. Um, but... You know, going into Wimbledon, Sinner could win. Alcaraz could obviously win. Djokovic might not play. So if he doesn't play, Sinner, Alcaraz, Zverev's playing great. You know, he, his serve on that surface is going to be scary. Then you got Medvedev on that surface. You got Sitsipas potentially. He's not as great on the grass, but you never know. So Alcaraz, obviously now three majors in the last three years, separating himself as the best player, I think in this group, but also sinners right there. But now it's kind of like sinners lost to Alcaraz a couple times now on silver courts on, on the clay. So it's going to be really interesting going into Wimbledon. 
if Djokovic isn't there, they'll be seated one and two on opposite sides of the draw, most likely. So that's going to be super interesting. If they play in the final and Alcaraz wins again, you're like, is he the real number one? Is he who's the number one? So the Onyx Center is on Monday going to be tomorrow the number one. Um, but it's very interesting. I don't know what else to say. Alcaraz wins Roland Garros. You've seen him do it. It's unbelievable to see this kid do what he's done. And he lifts the trophy that Rafa Nadal, his countryman, has lifted 14 times. And yeah, he is the freaking chosen one who is here to fulfill part of the void that the big three are going to leave when they are fully gone. So yeah, tournament crazy. Alcaraz comes in and wins it. Um, as I predicted, he would beat Zverev. He beat Sinner. He beat Sitsipas before that. He beat Felix Auger Aliassime before that. That's just a crazy run of form. He beat like all the best players on clay outside of Djokovic. I do think if Djokovic wasn't injured and they were able to play and Alcaraz played kind of the way he played against Sinner and Zverev and, and Djokovic was playing well and healthy and physically healthy, he could have capitalized on some things that Sinner and Zverev didn't for sure. There was some, there's some, you know, inconsistency and a bit of immaturity in Alcaraz's game in these two matches. And maybe Djokovic would have made him pay more for it, but we'll never know because now he's unfortunately torn his meniscus, had surgery, and is, like, and is going to miss Wimbledon most likely and potentially the Olympics. And honestly, his future is uncertain at this point. At his age, having like re, like a knee surgery, we saw it with Federer. I don't want to put any bad juju out there. But anyways, Alcaraz and Igastriantek win Roland Garros. Huge matches, huge tournament, huge results for them. What a tournament, what players. Stay tuned. If you haven't subscribed, subscribe. And I got we got a special new long form video coming out tomorrow that we'll be filming later tonight with a new special guest on the show. It's kind of some new longer form content, especially on the audio. So if you haven't downloaded or subscribed to our podcast on your audio provider, do that because we got more stuff coming for you. Thanks for being here. We appreciate you. And what a tournament. Thanks for watching all of our coverage. Thanks for being here. We'll see you next time here on The Slice.